Hi there and welcome to Dot Connecting with David Icke. This is the first one of 2014, so uh, welcome back. Without further ado, over to the man himself, David Icke. Hi David. Hi Rich. Isn't it great to be getting back to what this station was set up to do? Fantastic. Put out information that will alert people to where are we going unless we head That's it off, plan. which is what this was all about and why it was created. Um, and I'm going to take it on. You know the last Dot Connecting program? Um, talked about a guy called Dr. Richard Day and how he'd spoken to pediatricians in 1969. He was a Rockefeller insider. And he had in 1969 said, this is how the world's going to change. And it's like looking at the world today, not only uh, where it's going, but in many ways where it already is. And then there was the theme of George Orwell, um, who published uh, his book in 1948 um, called 1984, and look around you. It, the Orwellian state is, global state, is unfolding. Then you look at Older Suxley, Brave New World, published in 1932. Look around you. It's unfolding what he, in his novel, um, said was going to happen. And you can pick up these themes um, and these indications all over the place, if you research deeply enough, of how the way the world has gone and where it's going and what is happening today is not random. It's coldly, carefully planned. And I want to talk today about um, another example of that. It was a document I came across um, very early on in my uh, research, uh, which started around 25 years ago. And it's called Quiet Weapons for Silent Wars. Sorry, the other way around. Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. And what it is, Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, it's a, a manual for people who have come into the, the cabal, shall we say, or to work for the conspiracy to take us into this Orwellian state. It's a manual explaining how you manipulate the population through silent weapons. And silent weapons are different expressions of social engineering. Uh, my new book's called The Perception Deception, and that's what we're talking about. If you are going to control uh, billions of people, then you can't do it physically. There's too many of them compared with you, even with your, your jackboots in uniform. There's too many. You have to, um, you have to manipulate and program the perceptions of the population, the perceptions of themselves and the perception of uh, the reality and world events, so that they will then act and respond in a way that suits your agenda and allows this Orwellian uh, nightmare to unfold. And Silent Weapons uh, was dated uh, May 1979 and was apparently found in a, uh, a copier at a surplus sale in 1986 by an uh, employee of Boeing. And when you, 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 you find that um, in uh, the 1980s and you look at what it says, uh, people can say, well, someone's just made this up. So the proof of its genuineness and validity is, does what it says in there occur as the years go past? Well, this is how the manual um, described the nature and the consequences of this perception manipulation that is going on globally. Everything that is expected from an ordinary weapon is expected from a silent weapon by its creators, but only in its own manner of functioning. It shoots situations instead of bullets. Manipulate the situation, like I talk about problem, reaction, solution. Create the problem, uh, get the public to see the problem in the way that you've told them to see it, and then they will react by allowing solutions to that problem to occur that they would possibly have protested against and resisted had that uh, problem not been manipulated into place in the first place. It's propelled, talking about silent weapons, it's propelled by data processing instead of chemical reaction, explosion originating from bits of data instead of grains of gunpowder, 
from a computer instead of a gun, operated by a computer programmer instead of a marksman, under the orders of a banking magnate instead of a military general. It makes no obvious explosive noises, causes no obvious physical or mental injuries, and does not obviously interfere with anyone's daily social life. Yet, the document says, the silent weapons make an unmistakable noise, cause unmistakable physical and mental damage, and unmistakably interferes with the daily social life, i.e. unmistakable to a trained observer, one who knows what to look for. And as we go deeper into this, we'll see how um, the world is constantly being manipulated in terms of perception by manufactured events and manufactured, if you like, causes which are designed to have a response or an effect to the cause. And in doing that, and it's done in a scientific way based on fantastic um, uh, data that they gather and then process to see if you do that what will happen then. You see that the world that we think is random and is just happening by chance is unbelievably uh, in, in, in its depth um, manipulated um, on purpose. It, the document says the public cannot comprehend this weapon and therefore cannot believe that they are being attacked and subdued by a weapon. That David Icke, he's a nutter, he's saying it's a conspiracy and our perception is being manipulated. No, it's not. What's on the telly, darling? I, it's, it's, it's the, the, most people would never even think that their minds are being manipulated daily, minute by minute, to um, perceive the world and self in a certain way. Um, the public might instinctively feel that something is wrong. Now, isn't that true? How many people, more and more and more now, that's why more and more people are starting to look at the information that, that, that people like me and the People's Voice are putting out. There's just something wrong in the world. It, it, it's not right. I don't like the way the world's going. But what? But what? Um, and the idea is to use the silent weapons of social engineering without allowing people to realize how they're being manipulated. Thus, they instinctively think, well, something's not right, but they can't grasp um, what it is that's uh, not right. The public might instinctively feel that something is wrong, but because of the technical nature of the silent weapon, they cannot express their feeling in a rational way or handle the problem with intelligence. Therefore, they don't know how to cry for help and don't know who and how to associate with others to defend themselves against it. And it's interesting and, and so appropriate that we're talking about this document on a show on the People's Voice called The Dot Connector. Because <clears throat> as long as you keep those dots apart, you keep people in that feeling of something's not right, but what? And then you go boom, 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 picture, pattern, tapestry, Instead of a load of unconnected strands, people go, so that's what's happening. And it breaks the, one of the, the, the biggest, um, most powerful aspects of this social engineering silent weapons for a quiet wars, which is ignorance of how it's happening and to what end. When a silent weapon is applied gradually, very relevant this is, the public adjusts, adapts to its presence and learns to tolerate its encroachment on their lives until the pressure, bracket psychological via economic, here we go, economic crashes, austerity, uh, becomes too great and they crack up. And how, um, how obviously relevant and true is that? Um, what do I talk about? The totalitarian tiptoe where you start at A and you're going to Z, but you don't go in one big leap or big leaps, two big leaps, because people go, what's going on? There's changes going on. You go step by step by step. And I've, I've also talked um, in this program about how the system pushes the gate to the next stage of its agenda, and it's testing resistance. How many people are resisting the gate opening 
uh, to what we're now proposing. And if the resistance ain't great, they walk through it and they go to the next gate and they do it again. And all the time this is happening. Um, and so when a silent weapon is applied gradually, the public adjusts, adapts to its presence. I mean, if you took today's society and you had imposed it upon the people in the 1950s and the 1960s, just like that, overnight, what, what, what's happening? What's going on? The, the world's gone crazy. But because it's been done in steps, each step, well, I don't like this, it's big brother, you know, it's big brother gone mad. And then suddenly, well, it's, now it's the norm. So now the gate opens and we go on to the next, oh, I'm not sure about this. And, what, and what, well, there's only a few people saying, I'm not sure about this, because what the system's doing while they're pushing the gate open, they're saying, hey, have you seen the football scores today? You know, have, you, have you seen what's happening in the soap? What, yeah. What, what about the latest crap by Simon Cowell? Have you watched that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching it. Yeah, okay, well, we'll just walk through this gate while you're watching that. And this is, this is how the whole social engineering thing works. Um, and it says here, um, therefore, the silent weapon is a type of biological warfare. It is. It's a warfare on a, a war on our perception. It attacks the vitality, options, and mobility of the individuals of, society, of a society by knowing, understanding, manipulating, and attacking their sources of natural and social energy and their physical, mental, and emotional strengths and weaknesses. And one of the greatest ways that they target emotional strengths and weaknesses is by constantly giving people something to fear. Fear whether they're going to um, have a home at the end of the month. Fear if they're going to have a job. Fear if they're going to be attacked by terrorists. Fear of this uh, uh, disease or, 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 or whatever that they, they throw out through, through the media to frighten us. All the time. Fear, fear, fear. And when people are in a state of fear, they almost always look out of themselves, outside of themselves, to uh, find protection from what they've been manipulated to fear. And so here's more power to the state, here's more power to the uniforms, here's more power to the dark suits, because they will protect me from what they, in, in total, have persuaded me uh, to fear. Um, and we've also talked, I mean, it is quite obvious, really, um, how the power of the manipulation of money is controlling human society. It talks there about it being a, a, a banking magnet running all this and, and not a military general. And what's fascinating about um, silent weapons is that it mentions the House of Rothschild being the instigator of the economic system that we have and how the Rothschilds understood and understand, and all those that offshoot from them now, that the money system, I've been saying this for years, is actually run as an, uh, uh, an electronic energetic um, construct, like electronic circuitry. And, and indeed, when you look at it, the more that money you can hold and see uh, goes out of circulation, the more it is literally electronic circuitry. And so silent weapons um, details uh, the financial system at length and how it's controlled um, by uh, the, uh, the system that I've been exposing, and as I say, it mentions uh, Rothschild. This is what it says about money and economics. Economics is only a social extension of a natural energy system. I've been saying this for years. Since energy is the key to all activity on the face of the earth, it fo follows that in order to attain a monopoly of energy, raw materials, goods and services, and to establish a world system of slave labor, it is necessary to have a first strike capability in the field of economics. It says, in order to maintain our position, it is necessary that we have absolute first knowledge of the science of control over all economic factors and the first experience at engineering the world economy. And what they mean by first experience is we know how it works, but we don't let anyone else, let alone the target population, know how it works. Um, in order to achieve such sovereignty, it says, we must at least achieve this one end, that the public will not make either the logical or mathematical connection 
between economics and the other energy sciences or learn to apply such knowledge. Exactly what I've just said. It says to make a, a short sto story of it all, <clears throat> excuse me, it was discovered that an economy obeyed the same laws as electricity and that all of the uh, mathematical theory and practical and computer know-how developed for the electronic field could directly be applied to the study of economics. It's an electrical construct, which we see as money moving around and changing hands. That's why, because it is a computerized electrical construct, they can make the money go wherever they want it to go, i.e. towards themselves. It says um, this discovery uh, was not openly declared and its more subtle implications were and are kept a closely guarded secret. For example, I mean, wait for this. For example, that in an economic model, human life is measured in dollars. Is that true or what? And that the electric spark generated when opening a switch is connected to a, a, an active uh, inducer, inductor. That is mathematically uh, analogous to the initiation of war. And so we're seeing all these things going on that we call world events. But they're just um, uh, like an electrical system. This has to happen for this to happen. So we see that as a war. But to them, it's part of the economic construct and the, and, and the, the manipulation of the economic system, leading to a position which I've talked about all the time, where you've got a mass of the population, basically all but less than 1%, who are in abject poverty and slavery. Talks in here about slave labor, global slave labor. And then you've got the less than 1% in fantastic luxury. And what is money? It is merely uh, figures on a screen moving around, theoretically measuring the wealth of people. And if you control the electrical system, you move those electrical pulses in the uh, direction that you want. And that's how you create a less than 1% with fantastic, unbelievable amounts of wealth. In other words, electrical pulses stored on a database and you've taken it away from the mass of the population purely by the manipulation of electrical signals. But people don't realize this, though. They don't see what is happening. It's time to take a break. Now. Okay. Shall we take a break? We'll take a very quick break. That's the end of the first part of Dot Connecting with David Icke. <clears throat> when we come back, we'll have plenty more. Back in a minute. Welcome back to part two of Dot Connecting with David Icke. As I remind you, uh, from time to time, you can catch previous episodes on davidike.com and also on the People's Voice YouTube channel. David, back to you. Yeah, one of the, the things that the document Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars um, emphasises is the need to get maximum data on everybody. It points out that the more data you can get about people, the more control you can have because the better you understand that if you do that, they will react like that. And what we've got, of course, all these years later, since this was um, produced and later found and exposed, is staggering levels of data collection on people. I mean, we've seen the Edward Snowden revelations and, and, and all the others about the NSA in America. It's going on everywhere in GCHQ and in Britain. And this data, people think that it's only for surveillance. Well, it's surveillance for those that the system is concerned about and wants to know what they're doing because they're starting to suss the system and how it works. But it's also, collectively, it's about taking fantastic amounts of da data from people you can get it from the social networks and, and, and all these other sources now where people are giving them all the... It's like, you know, David Petraeus, you know, basically talked about when he was head of the CIA, you know. You, we don't have to 
keep surveillance on people anymore. They tell us all we want to know. In many, many cases, that's true. Uh, but it's going through these computers, and they're talking about you know, this great massive one they've just opened in Utah, which is processing information from all these different internet and phone and other sources. And they're, they're saying it's being held. Well, it ain't just being held. It's being processed. And computers of an of a, uh, advancement that would beg a belief, even in the public arena today, and see how far it's gone there, are doing the processing and coming up with a model that says, if you want the world to go here, you do that. And then what they do is that. Hey, presto. And interestingly, the next thing I'm going to come to from the document is something that the document calls shock testing. Here we are back to, if you do that, that's what will happen. And it talks, it calls it shock testing. And it describes it as like massive um, hikes in fuel, massive hikes in um, energy costs, massive hikes in food costs. It's done systematically, out of nowhere, or very quickly at least, and then the society responds and actually everything moves. The kaleidoscope moves as a result of it. And this is what the document says. Eventually, every individual element of the structure comes under computer control through a knowledge of personal, what have I just said? Personal preferences, such knowledge guaranteed by computer association of consumer preferences, universal product code, U UPC, zebra stripe pricing codes on packages, etc. It says, with identified consumers, brackets identified via association with the use of a credit card and later a permanent tattooed body number invisible under normal ambient illumination, microchips. Microchips. That's, that's, that's where, you know, we're obviously going, and they were talking about this um, in uh, 1979. But, of course, as we've seen in previous Dot Connecting shows, they were talking about this uh, uh, earlier. And it says that um, uh, silent weapons um, uh, it is uh, the manipulation, the mind manipulation, through things like advertising. Great line, this. This is a direct quote from the document. If a person is spoken to by a TV advertiser as if he were a 12-year-old, then due to suggestibility, he will, with a certain probability, respond or react to that suggestion with the uncritical response of a 12-year-old and will reach uh, into his economic reservoir, we would call a pocket, and deliver its energy, because money is energy. I've been saying all these years, they, that's what they see money as, at energy. We see kind of, you know, uh, coins and bits of paper, but to them it's energy. They're moving energy around. And they're trawling and vampiring the energy of the population through what we call, uh, through what we call money. They will uh, deliver um, the energy uh, to that product on impulse when he passes it in the store. So um, all the time... Adverti not just advertising, but mainstream television in general, is constantly suggesting things to people which go in the subconscious. And they're walking down the aisle, simple uh, uh, example, in a supermarket. Something catches their eye, and for, yeah, I'll buy that. Why are you buying that? I don't know. It's like, I'm going to try that. And it's all been put in the subconscious, uh, possibly uh, even weeks before. And it goes on, uh, Silent Weapons, about these price shocks. Um, economic engineers achieve the same results in studying the behavior of the economy and the consumer public by carefully selecting a staple commodity such as beef, coffee, gasoline or sugar and then causing a sudden change or shock in its price or availability, thus kicking everyone's budget and buying habits out of shape. They're moving the kaleidoscope. They're subtly changing society by simply saying, OK, we're going to hike the price of A, B, or C. They then observe the shock waves, which result by monitoring the changes in advertising prices and sales of that and other commodities. In other words, they're gaining knowledge all the time on how that cause will have that effect, and that effect will take society in the direction that they want. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, the objective of such studies is to acquire the know-how to set the public economy into a predictable state of motion or change. Even a controlled, self-destructive state of motion, which will convince the public that certain expert people should take control of the money system and re-establish security, rather than liberty and justice for all. When the subject citizens are rendered unable to control their financial affairs, they, of course, become totally enslaved, a source of cheap labour. And I've been, like I say, going on and on about this Hunger Games society, which is at the end of this, this road, if we don't uh, get together and, and head it off. What they're doing is that they are um, taking away people's ability to be self-sufficient financially. They're starting with all the austerity programs, but now with all the outsourcing and so many other things, they're eating into what we call the middle classes. The idea is through this control of this electronic energetic system we call money, is to take the money from the population. So the few, the state, are in control of whether they eat, whether they drink, um, whether they have shelter and all these things. And if you are going to have those things, you do as we say. And you become our, our literal slaves. And that is where we are heading. And this document written in 1979 uh, was uh, uh, saying that um, in, in very great detail. And of course, it's talking here about giving power to experts to sort out the problem. There's a guy called Zbigniew Brzezinski, a major, major insider in America. He was Jim McCarter's uh, former uh, national security advisor. And if you read a Brzezinski book, and, and you'll see the future, because he's telling you um, in, in what he's uh, saying and how he's saying society should change. And he was talking uh, decades ago now about the, um, the way that society would be moved into a, a, a position, which, which the insiders call the post-democratic, post-industrial society, the Hunger Games society, in other words. Um, and he was saying how technocrats, experts, would take over everything. We've already had non-elected bankers uh, in um, control of Italy and Greece because of the problems created by economic mayhem, which this describes, uh, is systematic. It's unfolding that silent weapons for quiet wars is unfolding before our eyes, just like 1984, just like Brave New World, and just like the uh, predictions of Dr. Richard Day I talked about last time in 1969. Uh, silent weapons says about money, not only the prices of commodities, but also the available, availability of labor can be used as a means of shock testing. Labor strikes deliver excellent test shocks to an economy, especially in the critical service areas of trucking, uh, transportation, communication, public utilities, energy, water, garbage collection, etc. By shock testing, it is found that there is a direct relationship between the availability of money flowing into an economy and the real psychological outlook and response of the masses of people dependent upon that availability. So, people on the left in politics, what I call often, you know, there are many genuine ones, but what I call the robot radicals, they think they're challenging the system. They are fundamentally part of the system because the system constantly needs polarities to play off against each other, to divide and rule. And a lot of these um, labor organizations that claim to be uh, there for the people, the workers, are actually infiltrated by this cabal to uh, create situations like the... If you look at the fantastic strikes in uh, Britain, uh, in... Um, the late 1970s, what do they call it, the winter of discontent. That, that was supposed to be a disaster for the government of the day. It was not. Um, it was a disaster for, um, if you like, human freedom in the sense of this. That uh, era of constant massive strikes, um, the system loved it. The people thought they were, they were challenging the system and opposing the system. system loved it, because what happened? They had the excuse, manipulation of perception, to bring in Margaret Thatcher and destroy the unions. 
and all the good things that unions were doing. And so if people see left opposing the system as good and the right the, the system bad, they've completely lost the plot. And, and robot radicals are often so self-obsessed that they're and so ignorant of the world and how they're being played like a stringed instrument that they will attack and try to undermine the very people who are exposing the system as it really is. Now, this, this is fascinating. It is to me as a, a, an observer of human behavior and perception and psychology. If you're doing all this, you've got to stop people realizing you're doing it. So you've got to get them looking in all directions except at what you're doing. It's just like the, the magician, you know. I'm, my trick's going here, so I'm going to divert you here while I'm doing it. So Silent war, Wars uh, or Quiet Wars goes into um, diversion and manipulation and perception in great detail, and it's fascinating. It says that... Um, there's a, a battle plan uh, and, a, and a war on perception, like I say. And this includes the targeting of people's perceptions by the following. Disengaging their minds, sabotaging their mental activities, providing a low quality program of public education in mathematics, logic, systems design and economics, and discouraging technical creativity. We have clearly had a major dumbing down of education. And what is education? It is getting children from the earlier and earlier ages now, it's putting them in a classroom um, at least five days a week, and it is having someone representing the system, telling them what's real and unreal, right and wrong, uh, possible and impossible, good and bad, all their formative years. But not telling them, because the person at the front of the class uh, next to the blackboard doesn't know because they're just going through the state's uh, curriculum, not telling them what they really need to know, which is A, that their infinite awareness and their body is an experience and the body's not what they are. They're not little me, they're infinite me. Uh, but more than that, they're not being told, of course, how the system works and how their perceptions are being manipulated and discouraging technical creativity. Um, Make them as intelligent as they need to be to build their own prison, but not intelligent enough to realize that's what they're doing. And it goes on about the diversions. It talks about engaging their emotions, increasing their self-indulgence and their indulgence in emotional and physical activities by unrelenting emotional affrontations and attacks, which it calls mental and emotional rape, by way of a constant barrage of sex, violence and wars in the media, especially the TV and the newspapers. And another aspect of that is desensitizing people from things that without the de uh, desensitizing, they would go, what the heck is happening? Oh, another war. Um, so it talks about giving uh, the target population what they desire in excess, what they call junk food for thought, uh, did I mention Simon Cowell? And depriving them of what they really need. Rewriting history and law and subjecting the public to the deviant creation. In fact, is don't let them know the nature of the reality that they are in. This is why science is so suppressed uh, and, and, and holds such a narrow band of possibility when people outside of that uh, mainstream science have a much greater awareness of the reality that we're actually experiencing. And it says if you do this, um, you are able to shift their thinking from personal needs to highly fabricated outside priorities. Um, do, I need, do I need to know the reality that I'm experiencing so I then have the power to interact with that reality and create a life that I want rather than one that is being given to me? No. Do I need to... Um, do I need to know how the world works and the forces that are manipulating my life? No. So what do I need? Nike trainers. That's what I need. Nike trainers. And a nice, a, a nice, um, nice T-shirt with the maker's name on it so I don't even, they don't even have to advertise anymore. I'm going to pay them to advertise for them. What do they call it? 
highly fabricated outside priorities. Diversions into nonsense. Well, I want the iPad. He's got a bigger iPad. Oh, my God. Do you know what the nature of reality is? No, I want an iPad, mate. This is what's been done. The human race has been manipulated and socially engineered into being, with honourable exceptions and growing, thank goodness, a bunch of kids in the playground. And um, it goes on then to encapsulate the silent weapons approach. Wait for this. Media. Keep the public... Um, Adult, the ad adult public attention diverted away from the real social issues and captivated by matters of no real importance. And that is exactly the reason the People's Voice was created and why the People's Voice must stay uh, on air. Because we are challenging that by treating people like adults and giving them uh, information that the nonsense that this is uh, talking about will never give them. Schools. Keep the young public ignorant of real mathematics, so they don't understand the money system for a start, real economics, real law, and real history. Don't let them know where it's all come from because that gives them a, a greater fix on where they are. Give them a false uh, timeline and uh, uh, sequence for where we got here, and then they won't understand where, um, where they are in anything like the same way. Entertainment. Keep the public entertainment below a sixth grade level. Did I mention Simon Cow? <laughs> work. Keep the public, this is lovely, this. Work. Keep the public busy, busy, busy with no time to think back on the farm with the other animals. In other words, keep them busy surviving. Got to survive. Rent, rent. Well, this is it. Simon Cow. And don't go, don't let them go, blimey. So that's what's happening. And it's all calculated and all set down in this document, which we will complete after the break, I think. We will indeed. We'll take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll have the final part of uh, Dot Connecting with David Icke. Back in a minute. And you're very welcome back to the final part of uh, Doc Connecting with David Ike. Very quickly reminding you once again is that you can watch previous episodes of it on YouTube and on davidike.com. David. Thanks. I'm just going to continue, Rich, with um, the diversions and the, the manipulations of perception and society that silent weapons for quiet wars. Uh, details in, in, in great detail. This is another list of things that it says they're set, set, they set out to do. Keep the public ignorant and you have less public organisation. And if you don't know there's a problem or what the problem is, how are you going to organise against it? Create preoccupations and you lower defences. We've talked about that. Get them to go into areas that are irrelevant and miss the ones that are really uh, relevant. Uh, you know, we, we, we talked about these various... Um, pre-knowledge documents and books and one of the common themes that I've been picking up is the family unit. They, they want to break up the fa family unit because they don't want anything that has coherence. They, they want nothing that has coherence. And here we go in this document. Attack the family unit and you control the education of the young. And what um, Dr. Richard Day was talking about, we mentioned in the last Doc Connecting show, was that um, schools were going to become the hub of the community. And if you see how parents uh, are losing rights after rights after rights over their children and their, and their future and what happens to them, um, while the state's getting those rights and dictating their child's life. That's the idea until there is no parental influence whatsoever. Give out less cash and more credit and you trigger more self-indulgence and social engineering data. In other words, let them have as much debt as they want. They will then become um, obsessed with consumerism and materialism. And as they're going around using the credit card, we're gleaning more and more data that we can put through these massively advanced computers to get a, 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 a very accurate um, understanding of how they will react if we do A, B or C. Encourage social conformity and you make programming easier. 
That means if, if, if there's someone who's putting their head up and saying, what about this? You, you hit them with a hammer. And you know what, it, what, you know what it, this, this, this social engineering, this manipulation of perception has reached such depth that you can have people saying, we must give the people a voice. The people must have a say. We must have the free flow of information. And when you create it, they want to destroy it. That's the level of, well, I would, it, it, for me, in my opinion, it is a form of insanity because the programming becomes so deep and the responses um, are so computer-like, so software-like, that there is no real control of perception and the behavior that comes from that perception because it's all reflex action, com almost computerized software responses. Uh, that has to be a form of insanity when you are comparing that with free thinking consciousness. Um, minimize protests about tax and you maximize the input of personal economic data while minimizing enforcement problems. Um, and what you've got, again, with, with, with the robot radicals over, over the years, it, you, you've got a lot of them saying, hey, tax more. And then you've got the right saying, tax less. Well, how about let's look at taxation and what it is, which is the state stealing energy from the people. Um, and and let, let's see if there's other ways that we can organize ourselves without uh, having the state um, taking uh, vastly increased all the time amounts of, of, of human energy earned by human effort. But no, more checks, less checks. What is the common denominator of those two things? Tax, which is what we need to address. Stabilize consent and you stabilize control. Again, get every people into the consensus. So now we've got political parties in, in America and, and in Britain and elsewhere that, that, that claim to be different and they're standing on the same uh, postage stamp. And, and the idea is to get the population the same and it's happening. Tighten control of variables, i.e. individuality, and you have greater predictability. So anyone that is a maverick, you look at the education system, it's always bashing the mavericks. They, they, they want to give them drugs now because they're saying the mavericks, who are nothing more than bored, um, they've got attention deficit disorder. So let's drug them because they're mavericks. They, hey, we've got one thinking for themselves over here. Quick, call the police. And it's the same with people in society, people like me and, and others who stand up and say, hey, this is not right. Hey, give him a bash. No problem. He's mad. Tighten control of variables like individuality and you have greater predictability. So clear. Maximize control and you minimize resistance to control. This is the more the police state comes in. And in many ways, and I've mentioned before, you know, the revelations of, of, about the uh, National Security Agency and the surveillance, it's great that people become aware of actually what's going on, to, to, to a certain extent anyway. But it, what that's also saying to you is, so anything you do... We know about it. And so it, it, it's, it's trying to, again, fear, frighten people into a situation where they freeze and don't challenge the system because um, they fear the consequences of doing so. And what you're doing is you, you're getting more and more and more people to conform um, and, and, and ha act like, um, uh, like, like the herd. Collapse the currency and you destroy faith in a country and each other. And that is um, obviously what's happening around the world with the uh, crashing of the, um, of the world economy. This document says, um, it is most interesting that by observing and measuring the economic models by which the public tries to run from their problems and escape from reality, and by applying the mathematical theory of operations research, it is possible to program computers to predict the most probable combination of created events, bracket shocks, which will bring about a complete control and subjugation of the public through a subversion of the public economy. Brackets by shaking the plum tree. 2008. Austerity. Um, Bail-ins. And um, it uh, talks about um, how the system depends on personal data and information being handed over by what it calls a docile public through what it calls, interestingly, legal brackets, but not always lawful force, especially in tax documents. Furthermore, 
The number of such forms submitted to the tax authorities is a useful indicator of public consent, an important factor in strategic decision planning. What, what resistance is there to the gate? And, and, and here's a, a, a fascinating um, kind of uh, almost, a, almost condemnation, if you like, of, of the way people accept anything. When the government is able to collect tax and seize private property without just compensation, it is an indication that the public is right for surrender and is consenting to enslavement and legal encroachment. No resistance, next gate. A good and easily quantified indicator of harvest time is the number of public citizens who pay income tax despite an obvious lack of reciprocal or honest service from the government. My brother said to me years ago, we're paying more tax and the services are getting worse. What's going on? Because they're taking the money. The money's going out of the system. That's what it's doing. And, and, and the less money there is in the system, the less money there is to go around, the more closer we become to the Hunger Games society when we have this mass poverty. And one of the... Um, one of the things that kind of comes from this as well, I think it's of major importance, is obviously if, if you are going to subjugate a target population of billions, you have to divide and rule them. And we have all the obvious divide and rules like religion and race and income bracket and culture. But the one, and this is um, in its own way talks about it, the one that's missed is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, divider and ruler of all. Me, me, me. When you are looking at every situation in response only to how does this benefit me, how uh, does this affect me, what are the consequences for me, you are, with that response with that attitude immediately disconnecting yourself from every other human being on the planet because this situation affects me 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 in what way you're already in a bubble instead of saying what is the fair and just thing to do in this situation not for me but for the greater good and when you do that, you connect yourself with the greater um, human family instead of disconnecting yourself from it. It's the ultimate divide and rule, where you're dividing and ruling people down, not to this group against this group or this religion against this religion, but actually individual against the other individuals on the planet. Because that's what me, me, me does. I don't care how it affects you, it affects you, it affects you. Me, me, me. So if you have a situation where um, you're only doing that, then obviously you're going to create a society based on me, 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 and um, a, a situation where what happens to other people doesn't matter. Now, you come across people who are in that me, me, me mode, and then they'll complain about austerity programs by governments, saying it's not fair on, that, on, on this person or that person. And, and we don't want a me, me, me society. We want a fair society. But when it comes to his situation, how do, how do I respond? The, the question is not how does the, the, the greater good benefit, but how does this affect me, me, me? And I would say this. I've said it before. What would change this world overnight and so dilute this process of percep perception manipulation that silent weapons for quiet wars... Um, details is if we started saying when a situation arose not how does this affect me what is the best thing to do for me in this situation but to say what is the fair and just thing to do for the greater good um, in the situation that I face so in it, with that attitude you might say well I, I might not get what I want out of this situation but if I did it wouldn't be fair. So therefore, you do the fair thing uh, rather than the me, me, me thing. Uh, uh, just think of that. If people started saying, what is the best, the most just and fair thing to do in this situation? Suddenly, the world changes. Suddenly, people are caring for each other. 
suddenly they are doing what is uh, right for the greater good rather than for themselves. And the, um, the manipulation of perception, the manipulation of the psyche that this document describes, one of its foundations is to get people to think only of self because they know that that in so many ways is the ultimate in divide and rule. And so you get situations where people um, say that something must happen and oh we must get behind something or this must happen for the greater good and then when something happens they don't like they want to destroy something that was created for the greater good and that's the kind that's what I mean um, and and so you get so-called radical people who claim to be fighting the system and they've been playing like played like a violin um, by the system and it's systematic and they don't know they're doing it because the system has them so you look at this and you look at what this social engineering wants to create which is a divided um, at war with itself society so the few can control the, the, the mass of the people so one antidote to it is don't always say what's right for me in a situation but what's right for the greater good the other thing is never give up never give up standing up for what you believe in because what this is designed to do is to put so much pressure on those that do stand up and speak out against the system and it's I've detailed a few things of how, what it says you do to them um, that they give up and walk away and, and in the 25 years I've been on this this road I've seen so many people come and they were flavor of the month in the conspiracy arena for a while and then they go and what happened to them don't know and then you come and then they go what happened to her don't know and then you think, oh no I can't be doing it anymore it's too much hassle mate you know I mean people are all people having a go at me oh I, I can't be doing with it and there's this thing they say um a puppy is for life not just for Christmas well if you want to head off what this and all these other things we talk about in the dot connecting show are dedicated to introducing if you want to head off your children and grandchildren and 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 people even alive today most of them alive today are going to face then challenging it is not when it suits you. Challenging it is not for a year. It's for life. And no matter what they throw at you, you never give up. Because that's what this is trying to get you into a state of cracking up and walking away. Too much pressure. Oh, really? I feel for you. What about people who haven't got anything to eat in, in Africa and, and other parts of the world? Hey, what about kids being abused? Um, and, and ha having, having their lives destroyed by, by uh, political paedophiles and, and all this other stuff that goes on. Yeah? What about all the people that are in desperate, desperate trouble now? Disabled people having their benefits taken away. And, uh, don't you tell me that standing up for what you believe in is, is, gives you more pressure than that. Let's never give up let's never walk away because what are we saying okay I accept that this nightmare society is going to happen because I haven't got the backbone to stand up to it ongoing for as long as it takes or what's happening to me is more important than that and if we don't do that in enough numbers this um, will reach its goal of a society that will have people nothing more than terminals on a computer system being told what to think being told what to do and having no freedom whatsoever 
You tell me the pressure's too great to stand up to that. And I'll tell you that, I'll tell you what, and I think I may have, I think I may have proved this over the years. No matter what's thrown at me for the rest of my life, however ever long it will be, I will never give up, ever, on challenging this and alerting people to it. No matter how me, 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 and people without a backbone to keep going may try to undermine me, I ain't going anywhere. Brilliant stuff, David. What a great way to end it. Thanks for that. Don't forget you can catch David on The Richie Allen Show Monday to Friday doing a paper review with me. That's it for this edition of Doc Connecting with David Icke. We'll see you on the next one. Bye for now. Thank you.